previous section, we described additional types of documentation available for your real-time system. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe advanced functionality of time loops. In Lesson 3, we'll talk about real-time processes and inter-process communication. So, loops within the RT system and how to communicate between them in a deterministic manner. When implementing processes on your real-time system, something to consider is a choice between while loops and time loops. While loops will be your standard method of execution that you're used to from Windows targets. Time loops have some additional functionality as well as some additional caveats to consider when working on a real-time system. Chief among these is time loops will execute at a higher priority than while loops. In terms of the execution priorities available in LabVIEW, it will run above the high priority, but below time critical. That means that anything that you put in a time loop is going to have higher CPU priority than something you put inside a while loop. Plan accordingly, and don't put high priority processes in a while loop, or very low priority processes within a time loop. Otherwise, you may find yourself with a priority inversion. Before we get into too deep about the time loops, let's talk a bit more about scheduling. This should be review from the RT1 class. But it's a good refresher nonetheless. When working with a round robin scheduling scheme, threads of equal priority will receive equal shares of processor time. And it might take multiple goes around of that round robin scheduling before. thread is finished with everything you would like to do. Preemptive scheduling is when a higher priority thread immediately tells everybody else they must halt until it gets to execute. Preemptive is essentially jumping in line, if you will. They go to the front because they're high priority. Round robin one at a time, everyone gets their fair share. While loops use a round-robin scheduling algorithm. Every while loop within a VI of the same priority level is going to be executed on a round-robin basis with all other while loops at that same priority level in the VI. A timed loop is going to use preemptive scheduling. Each timed loop has its own priority value associated with it. If a time loop of higher priority than a lower priority time loop wants to execute, it will get to do so. The lower priority time loop will have to wait for cycles to be available before it can be scheduled. So some best practices when using time loops. Usually, we're only going to recommend that you use one time loop per core. So if you have a quad core system, that would roughly translate to four time loops. The reason why we ask this is using multiple time loops will add some complexity and overhead to your system because then we'll have to invoke more scheduling algorithm overhead to determine which time loop to run. If there's only one time loop on the system and everything else is a while loop, pretty obvious which one's going to have priority. It's going to be the time loop. Something that can be a caveat here, though. Time loops are single-threaded. What that means is that anything contained within that time loop, even if it looks like it could run in parallel, will actually not. It's going to run in a single thread created for this specific time loop. In a while loop, if you had, say, two parallel tracks of execution within the while loop and two cores on which you could schedule tasks, both tracks of execution may be able to run simultaneously. The same is not true inside of a time loop. If you have independent, separate operations, they should be in separate loops if you're using time loops. So deterministic code should be placed within a time loop code that doesn't necessarily need to be deterministic, such as file I.O. or network access, 
recommend that you don't use a time loop, but rather put them into a while loop. On the surface, a time loop may seem like just a while loop with some blue border around it, but they do provide you with quite a bit of advanced functionality on real-time systems. Here's some of the details. They can give you some monitoring and debugging information to let you know how your loop is performing. You have the ability to change input node values dynamically. For example, if you wanted to change the period of the loop on the fly, you could do so. You can abort specific time loops from a central control loop in your system. You can synchronize multiple time loop starts so that they happen at the same time or with particular offsets. And you also have the ability to create software-defined timing resources. Let's talk about monitoring and debugging functionality. The previous iteration timing options are ones that I use the most common with time loops, especially the finished late terminal or the iteration duration terminal. Those will tell me if the last time I tried to run this loop, did it finish on time? Part of the configuration of a time loop is how often it's supposed to run, and also a deadline for how long it's allowed to take before it is finished. This will let me know that it finished late the last time I tried to run it, which might mean that my system is not running as fast as it needs to to keep up with my data. In this example, we're keeping a count of any time that the loop finished late. That can be a very handy debug information for us. Oftentimes I'll monitor or finish late count, or latch the fact that any loop had finished late at all, and determine if my system is running as fast as it needs to, or if perhaps I have a performance problem that I need to investigate. If a critical loop finishes late, this can be a trigger to send the application into either recovery or a safe shutdown mode. If it can't keep up with normal operations, this is a much better way to go than letting it keep going, fall further and further behind, and potentially creating a dangerous situation. I mentioned the iteration duration terminal. This is one of my favorite usages of the time loop, because it'll give me an actual measurement of how long it took me to finish the last iteration of code. This is great for benchmarking, great for monitoring, and give me this average of the loop iteration durations. That way I can tell, how long does this actually take to run? How close to getting this right am I? Am I wildly off on my estimate of how long this loop should take to run? If so, I probably have some more investigation to do to determine why. Am I just this close to getting it to run at the period that I need it to run? Well, then this will let me know that as well. I highly recommend instrumenting your code in a way similar to this, so that you can see how long your code really takes. That'll let you know how much work you have in front of you to get this code working the way you want it to go. Another option that you have is to change the input node values dynamically. The input node is going to be the blue region on the right hand side within the loop, it says DT in this example. Here, what we're doing is evaluating the period of the system. Occasionally, we may want this one to run more frequently. So here, we have the loop going to run at a longer period of 600 milliseconds during the first 100 iterations. Following that, it will run with a 400 millisecond period. It's pretty common for real-time systems to require a little bit of extra time when the system is first starting up, just due to initialization of various processes and more demands on the processor during that time. In this case, we're giving it a wider margin then, and then tightening that limit a little bit once we expect the system to run at a steady state. Oftentimes, if we've got multiple time loops, we want to make sure that one of those time loops starts before the other one does, just to ensure that the first iteration has good data on both sides. An example of that may be one loop that acquires data from hardware, and another loop that takes the last acquired value and performs some action based on it. We might want to make sure that we acquire data before trying to operate on it. Here, we have two loops. One is labeled fast, and the other is labeled slow. And for the fast loop, we don't provide an offset. For the slow loop, we provide an offset of 100 milliseconds. This ensures that the slow loop will start 100 milliseconds after the top loop does. And if you also look on the right, you'll find that we're taking the names we assign to each of these loops and using the stop time structure VI 
to stop all those time loops. This can be an alternative way to setting the stop fast button and the stop slow button to make those loops stop. It can be very handy if you're trying to synchronize the stop of multiple time loops. This way you don't have to necessarily keep track of which boolean you're using, but rather send a stop signal directly with this function. Another option that you have with time loops is to create a software trigger timing source such that rather than the loop iterating based off of the internal clock, it will iterate when it receives a certain event. In this case, we have an upper loop where we fire software trigger timing source. What that will do is basically tell the time loop it's time for it to execute now. And you could call that at whatever interval you wished. It is essentially acting very much the same as a event type communication would work not on execute every 100 milliseconds, but execute when some thing happens. And when you choose to fire that software triggered timing source is up to you. A pretty common example of when you would use that is to notify another loop that it has data available, and now it's time for it to run. If you may not want that loop to try and do anything until that data shows up, this can be a nice way to reduce your CPU usage. Something else to consider? is we have not just a time loop, but also a time sequence structure. Time sequence structure in the previous section, we described advanced functionality of time loops. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe the basics of closed loop control. So in the next exercise, you'll implement a closed loop control system to control the temperature within a temperature chamber. Let's take a quick review of what In the previous section, we described advanced functionality of time loops. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe the basics of closed loop control. So in the next exercise, you'll implement a closed loop control system to control the temperature within a temperature chamber. Let's take a quick review of what a closed loop control system consists of. First, we're going to have a system, which we'll call the plant. Uh, it's a pretty common term when talking about control systems. This plant will be monitored by some sensor feedback. In our case, the plant is the temperature chamber. The sensor feedback is a thermocouple. The process variable will be what the current temperature of the system is. The set point will be our desired temperature. And then we'll have a PID controller that will look at how far off our set point and process variable are from each other and come up with there's the power of control a actuator output value to control the system in the direction we wish it to go. The actuator output in this example will consist of two items. One is a lamp, which if the process variable of our temperature is too far below our set point, it will turn on the lamp such that we will add more heat. The second actuator output will be a fan. If the process variable of temperature is too high above the set point, we will enable the fan so that we will reduce the temperature. Let's translate that into LabVIEW terms. The process variable will be measured by a thermocouple sensor, which is attached to the 9211 analog input module. This will tell us what the actual temperature within the chamber is at the current moment. The set point will be an input. In this case, it's going to be a control on the front panel. In the eventual system, this set point will come from other components within the system. The controller will be handled by a PID function, and the actuator output will be handled by a pair of, out, of outputs. Those outputs are on the 9474 digital output card, and will be controlled based on the PID output. All this will control the temperature chamber itself. And now for one slide summary of years of controls theory. 
The proportional integral derivative or PID control algorithm is one of the most popular and used out in the field today. One of the main reasons is it's quite simple to implement. Almost every uh, controls package out on the market is going to have a PID controller. There's three components to it. There's the proportional component. So this is the direct error, the current error. So the further the system is from the set point, the larger the actuator output will be to drive it to that set point. The integral component is the longer the system has been off from the set point, the larger the actuator output. So you can consider this as the accumulated error over time. How long have we been off? The derivative component is the faster the system is changing, the larger the output. In some ways, this is a predictive output. This is accounting for expected future error. In this exercise, we'll create a deterministic temperature control loop by using a timed loop. This loop will become part of the overall course project and we'll combine this with some later exercises to get a robust control system. Let's take a look at the solution to the exercise. You should have started with the temperature chamber project, which was provided to you in the exercises folder. We're going to keep building on this project throughout the class. This exercise focused on the temperature control VI, which we had you create. Here's the front panel. We have a set point, which will allow the user to input what the desired temperature is in degrees Celsius. We have a current temperature output, which will output the current temperature of the chamber in degrees Celsius. We also have a field to input the PID gains, proportional, integral, and derivative components of the algorithm. In our case, we have a high proportional gain, no derivative, and a smaller integral. What this will do is push the temperature very quickly in one direction or the other, and it'll probably give us some overshoot. Let's look at the block diagram. Here we have a pretty simple block diagram consisting of a single timed loop and the PID function. Here's a temperature I.O. variable that communicates directly with the scan engine on the Lavi of PGA target. This I.O. variable is passed to the process variable input. The set point, what the user directs us as the desired temperature, that is passed to the set point input. Right now, this is just on the front panel of this RTVI. We'll do more with that later. And of course, we pass in our PID gains as an input to the system. The temperature that is currently read off the FPGA is sent to the front panel as well. And the output of the PID algorithm is sent directly to the lamp output and is used as an offset off of the highest possible value towards the fan. Basically, the fan is meant to cool, the lamp is meant to heat, so we switch them around. And over here, we're just resetting the fan and lamp values to a known safe output of zero when we're done with this program. In the corner of my screen, we have a camera set up to the temperature chamber that we have here. Let me run this code, and you can see what the effects are of changing our set point deploy the code now. Everything went okay. And notice that the fan is turned on, as you can tell by this piece of fabric flipping around. The current temperature is a little bit less than what we'd like, so if you notice this lamp is starting to come on as well. Let's say I want a really high temperature. Notice how the lamp became much brighter and the fan turned off. I'm going to do the reverse. I'll set the set point very low. See that the lamp turned off and the fan is now trying very hard to cool the chamber. Let me give the set point at 25 and we can see it settle eventually to its expected value. The idea of the PID algorithm is that once we reach a steady state, we can maintain that state and apply whatever corrective adjustments are necessary to the system to keep us at that desired set point. And here we had a little bit of overshoot as it went a little bit too far. And now this integral component is helping us out and bringing us back up. Okay, so we're starting to get a little closer and it's going to settle much better over time. So now you can describe the basics of closed loop control and see how they were implemented within LabVIEW. Next, we'll describe how shared resources can cause jitter in your real-time system.